Welcome to the Cambridge Union. Thank you for coming. Um, tonight we're very honoured to be able to host Mr Ed Richards. As you all know, Ed is the head of Ofcom, the chief executive, I should say. I say that, yeah. Um, which is, of course, the independent telecommunications regulator and competition authority for the communication industries. As well as being a major force in policy decisions on issues such as product placement, broadband and local radio programming, Ofcom also regulates the UK media, responding to complaints about TV and radio shows. Um, Ed was previously a controller of corporate strategy at the BBC and a senior policy advisor to Tony Blair. He's also worked in consulting at London Economics Limited and as an advisor to Gordon Brown. So um, would you please put your hands together for Mr. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, and, uh, and it's very well timed actually because we've done this uh, two weeks ago, a week ago, then I would not have been able to say any of what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I know we were just talking on the way up, I know you're, you're having Julian Assange next week, uh, or Assange, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and he is going to be obviously amazing and interesting. And I was thinking about him. and. You know, what WikiLeaks did, uh, particularly with the release of all the American diplomatic uh, material, it, it was like this extraordinary meteorite that sort of flew across the globe, uh, challenging all sorts of assumptions about information and about provision of news and indeed, of course, the role of the media in all of that kind of thing. Uh, and it created this inevitable reaction right across the, the world. Uh, and that, that is, of course, what meteorites do, I guess. Now, what I want to do tonight is not talk about those kinds of extraordinary instant events, but more about the what you might call the consistent features of uh, news and information and the media in our society and how important that is to the democracy that we live in and how important the features of that are to... Uh, all of us really every day of every single week. Now, I've chosen to talk about this, uh, and as I said, I couldn't have done two weeks ago, partly because it's this set of issues which has placed uh, our organisation, Ofcom, right in the centre of news itself over the last few weeks amidst this really quite furious controversy about who controls and who influences our news and our news agenda. Um, and if it would be a useful opportunity just to talk um, uh, openly, really, about uh, what we did say and what we didn't say about this, this central set of issues. Uh, and the central set of issues was around, of course, the perennial question, or one perennial question, which is, does Rupert Murdoch own and control too much of British media? And that issue uh, has been subject of very vigorous debate in our world and indeed nationally over the last few months. So just to explain why, for those who don't know exactly what we, we do, we are the communications regulator, so we do things like make sure there's enough competition in the mobile phone sector or the ISP sector. Uh, we make sure that radio spectrum is allocated, so uh, when you're using Wi-Fi, uh, that spectrum comes from us, is allocated by us. Uh, and when you're using a mobile, mobile phone, the spectrum that that uses comes from us as well. Uh, we also regulate standards on television and radio, so if you want to complain about um, Frankie Boyle, uh, or if you want to complain that people have complained about Frankie Boyle, you <laughs> contact us. Uh, so we do all of those sorts of things. But one of the other things we do is advise the Secretary of State on what's called the question of plurality. Uh, and plurality is about who controls or how many people control media in the UK. And we think in our view, it's really concerned about, uh, or with the view that in, in any healthy democracy, you need to have media who report on, who challenge, and who hold to account uh, politicians, corporations, and really anybody else who holds power. Uh, and you need to do that, and you need to have a media which can do that in a way which complements and supports the accountability that ha takes place through the ballot box. Uh, one that supports and buttresses and feeds off the other. And if you think about how important this is, uh, it's quite straightforward because it's, if you just cast your eyes around the world and you uh, spot rotten governments, um, you will see very quickly that those rotten governments are almost always associated with rotten media. 
uh, one almost always goes with the other. Uh, and what I mean by rotten media are media who are simply not free, which, for example, is the case in Libya or any other regime of that kind that you want to think of, or more difficultly, more difficultly sometimes, uh, media which are so heavily concentrated amongst a small number of people that the owners themselves can actually trade privilege and patronage with powerful politicians or powerful corporations and trade privilege and patronage in that way on an almost equal basis or in some time, in some occasions, uh, even worse. Now, in those circumstances, what you end up with is media businesses who become uh, too much, in a sense, uh, players in political and corporate power, rather than being businesses or enterprises who act as a constraint and discipline on political and corporate power, which is really what you want your media to be doing. Uh, for me, this idea of plurality is actually a very clear one. Now, it's an enormously powerful and simple idea, and it is slippery, it is difficult to define, and lots of people have failed to define it absolutely precisely. But the fact that you can't give a perfect definition of it does not mean that it's not a really important and crucial idea for any uh, democracy. And that's certainly what I believe, and I think it's what our organisation believes as well. So let me now just take you quickly back to the case in hand. So last November, as you probably all remember, uh, News Corporation, Rupert Murdoch's um, uh, business, uh, notified that it was going to, were intended to buy the rest of Sky. So they already owned 39% of Sky and they were going to buy the rest of it to give themselves a 100% controlling stake. Uh, Vince Cable, Secretary of State for Business and Innovation Skills, uh, asked us to look at this and review whether or not it raised public interest concerns and would warrant further analysis. Now, of course, you'll all remember there was another little sort of chink, uh, another little uh, element of the story, uh, where the responsibility for this was transferred from Vince Cable to Jeremy Hunt. It was all to do with his remarks to some young journalists and some hidden microphones that you may remember uh, and I, I think that's been well rehearsed so I probably don't need to talk about that anymore. But the question for us uh, was really quite a precise one which we were asked by the Secretary of State. Uh, we were asked, I paraphrase slightly in the interest of privacy because it's quite a long and detailed one, but essentially we were asked to look at the merger uh, in light of the need for there to be a sufficient plurality in the number of people controlling the media in the UK, so quite a specific question. Uh, and that was the only question which we were able to answer. That is the way these things work. The Secretary of State asks us a specific question and legally we have to answer that question. So we can't go off into a diatribe about any given media owner or uh, whether we like them or dislike them. That is not what we have to do. We have to answer the question and that's what we tried to do. So. We said what this is really about, in our view, in terms of media plurality, is, is really at its core about news and information and news and current affairs. It's how people receive their news and information and how it influences them and what role that plays. So you could take a broader definition of that, but we focused on news and current affairs. And we had to ask whether the proposed takeover of Sky, full takeover of Sky, would increase news corporation and therefore Murdoch's ability to influence the news agenda to a level beyond which there would be the so-called sufficient plurality, in other words, enough people only news outlets to give you confidence about the quality of uh, news provision, or the quality of diversity of news provision in the country. Now what mattered in that was of course that if the merger went ahead, if it does go ahead, it means that Sky and therefore Sky News which is of course one of only two 24-hour news channels in the UK, would cease to be a distinct media voice. It would essentially be thereafter fully controlled by Murdoch News Corporation. Uh, and that, that's clearly uh, an issue of great concern to a lot of people. So what we set out to do is try and measure and test uh, in, uh, influence and plurality. Now, this is more difficult than it, than it sounds. Uh, so, for example, if you take, uh, let's imagine all the four people in the front row, that you spent a minute or you spent an hour reading the Sun, you spent an hour reading the Times, 
You spent an hour watching BBC News, and you spent an hour listening to Capital Radio News. Now, do we account for those as equal? Is a minute spent reading the sun as important as a minute spent reading an editorial in The Economist? It's really quite difficult to work out what currency, or what measure you use to assess what, who has influence and what influence is. Uh, and that's what we had to do. So we, we, the way we did it was look at all sorts of industry data and try and build up a picture by virtue of these multiple sources of information. We looked at what people consume uh, over different media, how many minutes, how much they valued it by virtue of how much they were willing to pay for it. And then we did some research to ask people, what, your, what is your main source of news? So we literally went out and asked a representative sample, where do you think you get your news from? What is your main source of news? And then where do you, what is the, what are the other important sources of news? And we got some fantastic in research back on that. Uh, and the, probably the highlight that's worth drawing out of it is that, I guess this, this probably it didn't surprise me, but it may surprise uh, some, of, some of you being considerably younger than me. Uh, but, the, but the most decisive feature of it was that uh, the dominance of TV news. Now you probably all get most of your news from the internet, I reckon. Uh, but 73% of adults say that their main source of news is TV. And that dwarfs everything else. So it's 8% say newspapers, 7% radio, and only 7% the internet. Whereas your generation, it's probably completely different. But that is what it is at the moment. So 73%, so 10 times higher than anything else, TV news is the main source of news. So that's very important, obviously, because what we're concerned with here was the takeover of Sky News, a TV news service, one of only two television news services that are on 24 hours a day. So that's the kind of information that we had to look at. And all of that taken together gave us a sense of different organisations' ability to influence opinion in terms of their role in people's lives. How much uh, news were they consuming from different organisations? How important was it to them? Uh, and things of that nature. Uh, and what's striking about the merger is that it would, if it goes ahead, combine two of the main four providers of news. So the BBC is by far the biggest, but the BBC, of course, is unique in the sense that it's funded in the way that it is, and it's a public body. It's not beholden to any shareholders with any particular interest. But then it's uh, Sky and ITN, and then it's News Corporation, by virtue of its newspapers. So for those who've forgotten, the News Corporation controls completely the Sun, the News of the World, the Times, and the Sunday Times, which accounts for something like, I'm not going to get it quite right, but something like 32, 33% of the entire newspaper market. So it's a considerable chunk of the media. And this would obviously bring together full ownership of not only all those newspapers, but also Sky News uh, as well. And that's very important because even if you ask people what their main source of news is, you then also say, well, where else are they getting news from? And what you typically find is that that combination of newspapers and Sky News is not only powerful in terms of the main source of news, but it's also incredibly powerful in terms of their secondary sources of news. And that, that matters in terms of the sources of information people are having. Um, so we looked at that uh, and we said to Jeremy Hunt at the end of last year that in our view that proposed acquisition may well be expected to operate against the public interest uh, since there may not be as a result of it enough a sufficient plurality of people with control of media enterprises. That was essentially the conclusion we sent over. We focused very much on the implications for Sky News because of the reasons that I've set out. And we recommended a second review, and that that second review should go to the Competition Commission. And Jeremy Hunt, Secretary of State, said he would follow our advice on that. So that worked uh, as we would ex expect it to in those circumstances. Our independent advice was accepted. And you know, I'm very happy to talk a little bit more later, if you like, about what the reasoning was that under, underlay that. But it, the flavour of it, I've tried to, go, I've tried to give you the flavour of it. What then happened was that News Corporation, of course, came back saying, here are a set of undertakings, these are things we will do if you let them, if you're willing to let the merger through. And there were a series of negotiations uh, and some disagreements on, on the route. 
Uh, but in the end, after a series of revisions, we ended up with a set of undertakings. So in other words, commitments by them. You know, if you let this go through, we will do the following. Uh, and these commitments and undertakings, in our view, would address the concerns that we previously set out. And those undertakings are very interesting. Uh, what they involve are uh, News Corporation agreeing to spin out Sky News as a separate company, as a complete, as a complete separate company, with the same shareholding that it currently has. So they would be left in the current the position they're in, so they would not have an increased shareholding. Um, those shares are distributed amongst all the current shareholders. Uh, News Corporation would not be allowed to increase its shareholding without the permission of the Secretary of State for another 10 years. Uh, there would be a 10-year contract and brand license agreement to secure its future, to make sure it was viable in the context of the difficulty of making news a, a viable business, which is not an easy thing to do, as I'm sure you're all there. Uh, and that to ensure the editorial independence of the organisation, which is what really matters to us, uh, the company would have to be made up of a majority of independent directors and independent chairmen uh, and a uh, governance and editorial committee made up of independent directors. So a sort of security to make sure that uh, the company was run along the lines of what we asked for, which was the... Uh, establishing the principle of editorial independence at the heart of the company. So in other words, a protection for the editorial independence of Sky News in the event the merger went ahead. Now, uh, that's what was on the table. There was some disagreement about that, as I've said, on, on, on route, but that's what we've ended up with. Uh, and that's the proposal that is now in the public domain uh, from, from last week. Um, People have already asked a lot of questions about this, as you can imagine, it's been ferociously debated uh, in the press. Uh, the press is particularly interested in it for obvious reasons. Um, one obvious question was, well, why didn't we just say, surely Sky News should just be spun off completely and separated and somebody else can buy it and own it? Now, that's a fair question. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, however, there are two answers to it. First is that uh, if we, the task in front of us was to secure this, at least the same position as before the merger was proposed. It wasn't to go and reinvent the world, it was to secure the position before the merger was proposed. Now in fact, what we believe we have on the table now is something that is, that is better than before the merger was proposed. So we think that's good. Uh, but the second problem is that, as I mentioned a moment ago, making these kind of new services sustainable is really, really hard. I mean, you don't make money out of them. You know, very few news organisations make money. So they're not rational, normal businesses. And our worry about a more severe remedy would be that actually you spin it off and no one would buy it and it would just end up being closed down. Now, if that happened, that's not done anybody any good. You've just lost a very good quality high calibre news service providing an alternative to the BBC. Uh, and if that's what we're in the business of, then that seems to be a crazy thing to, to have done. So that's the reason we didn't go in that direction. That's left us with a position where I think we've got a credible solution for this particular merger. Uh, I know many people up and down the country, and in particular some of the other media organisations, do not agree with that. And they, uh, they are going to to comment on that and we will listen very carefully to what they have to say. Uh, other people think it's all been a fuss about nothing and we needn't have bothered having a discussion about it in the first place. So there really is quite a polarised opinion on this uh, and we've tried to do what we were asked to do and then, and then provide some cool analysis uh, on the subject. Uh, that said, we do I think still have some quite serious reservations about the risks in this area. So in other words, the, the risk that there could be a development of uh, further concentration of power in the UK and EU in the future. And there's a very interesting contrast with competition. So in competition in economics of markets, uh, we are we're in very good shape. We've got a fantastic set of legal tools. We have, the Office of Fair Trading have, other regulators have, and I think we can address those things with confidence. Um, but the same is not true in relation to this issue of plurality. Uh, there are gaps in relation to plurality. 
Uh, and we need now to start, I think, thinking about uh, what we do about that. In particular, the problem is that if you end up with a situation when you turn around and say, well, there is now too few people who own have too much control over the media uh, in the UK, but that has arisen not because of a merger, not because one company's bought another, then the, as things stand, there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, and that is quite a serious difference from the competition regime, uh, and it's quite a serious difference from, or it, it, defect, in our view, uh, to the current system. Um, now, wh why does that matter? Well, one reason is that the communication sector itself and how news and information is provided and consumed and so on is incredibly fast moving. If you go back just 10 years, there has been a revolution in the way that news is being dis disseminated, distributed and consumed, most obviously via the internet. And so I do think your generation will consume news and already do in a completely different way to the way my generation consumed it and my generation consumed it in a completely different way to my parents generation and I think the pace of change in that area is getting faster not slower uh, some of you probably already got iPads or things of that kind and you know I've got an iPad now and it has already completely changed the way I get my news in the space of two weeks uh, and I think that is going to wash through the economy and through society over the next, you know, for, I think that will wash through the next couple of years. So the point here is a really quite straightforward one. There's huge underlying change take, taking place, uh, which is more visible to me probably than it is to you because of the, because I've been alive longer, so I can see the changes. Um, and that change, we need to have a system which, which can adapt to it. You know, newspapers I've mentioned on a number of occasions, they are facing unprecedented economic pressure. Uh, it is really not clear uh, how many will survive over a five, ten year period. Uh, when you look at, uh, you, know, you probably all read newspapers online, not in newsprint form. Uh, that's what I do now. Uh, it's quite rare for me to buy a newspaper nowadays. The trouble is, the advertising or the money they derive from me reading it online compared to reading a proper newspaper is a small fraction. But the cost of producing it is exactly the same because the journalist costs what the journalist did before. So there is a really fundamental problem here. TV and radio face similar if different challenges, all about, all driven by the internet. And the internet itself has not worked out how you can make a sustainable model for high quality journalism. Uh, nobody has successfully done that and all the people doing it are doing it because they have to, because everybody else is, but nobody's got a model that really works yet. So there's going to be a huge amount of change and nobody quite knows where it will end. Um, but a lot of that change could be organic, in other words it will just happen over time in an evolutionary sort of way, it won't be incident based or event based won't be, in particular, as a result of anybody saying, well, I'm going to take you over, or I'm going to merge with you. It will just be gradual and, uh, and change over time. Now, because we can't predict that, and because we know that it might happen in that form, it must be a, a serious risk that there could be changes which, in which we all turn around in five or ten years' time and say, well, look, somebody whoever it may be, has now got incredible power over the media and incredible influence over what people, uh, what news and information is provided to people, and that feels very uncomfortable. And it think self-evidently of the position that Italy has found itself in with Silvio Berlusconi's media power, and the fact that he ended up becoming a politician as well, I think simply underlined the point rather than weakened it. So we don't want to end up in that kind of place, and uh, we need to have a system which makes sure that we can address that sort of thing if and in the circumstances that it, ha it happened. And we don't <coughs> at the moment. And it could happen quickly over the next three or four or five years and we have no remedy for it. You'd have to rely upon a government to pass primary legislation really hard. So that's why we said to the Secretary of State also that not only should you get these undertakings in relation to this particular case, but you need a much more radical reform of the legislation in this area. Uh, you need to have something which allows us to give protection 
to plurality concerns arising from these kinds of general developments. Um, and you know, it's worth just spending a minute or two saying, well, what might they be? What might that look like? Uh, I think at root it's just you need to have a mechanism for invoking some sort of review to say, is there sufficient plurality in our media? Are there is a wide enough range of people who are able to uh, exercise control over the provision of news and information? Uh, the competition framework, as I've said, provides one such mechanism for that. Uh, we can do a test which, uh, which for, on competition grounds, which says uh, something like, you know, are there reasonable grounds for suspecting that there are features of the market which prevent, restrict, or distort competition. So it's a very general power. And it seems to me that that could easily be remodelled such that you could say, uh, remodel for the purposes of plurality by saying something like, are there reasonable grounds for suspecting that there are feature or combination of features on the media sector in the UK that may operate against the public interest, uh, taking into account the need for there to be sufficient plurality of control over the media. So essentially a replication of that, but it's a very straightforward uh, uh, model. Um, then you've just got to say, well, who's got the right to initiate it? And it could be us or the Secretary of State. Uh, and then you've got to say, how do you refer it on? Uh, and should the, well, how do you do the depth of a review? And I think that's, that's pretty much, uh, uh, you, you mirror the competition regime. So fairly straightforward. Um, and what we're concerned about here is those particularly you know, big changes in the in the uh, in audience shares over time. Who is who is watching what? Big changes to uh, market entry and exit. You know, you can have, we might have see Google or Apple or goodness knows else who else play huge roles in this over the next decade. That may well happen, or we may not, and we may see some of the big people that uh, we've all grown up with uh, <coughs> being in our of providing news and information in our society, not being there anymore. You know, they're not gone in five or ten years. And we've got to be able to adapt and respond to those kinds of changes. Um, now, the key thing about this is that if you did a review of that kind, you have to have remedy, you have to have something you can do about it at the end of it. And uh, inevitably, those are quite potentially quite considerable. And they'd have to be all sorts of remedies up to and including um, uh, divestment, in other words, making companies give up certain things they own if it's contrary to the public public interest. And you have to have that sort of backstop position in order to make it a meaningful test and review. Um, so you wouldn't want to do, and I don't think we would want to argue for legislation of this kind to be entered into lightly, uh, and nor would you want it to be easily or casually invoked. Uh, and it would need to balance, on the one hand, the importance of protections for democracy, the kind that we've talked about, um, and on the other hand, uh, not avoiding creating any unnecessary uncertainty and the kind of perverse incentives that would uh, undermine investment in news and media. Jeremy Hunt said he's going to look at it. We're very pleased about that, and that will be that will be the next step. It will be a small step on the road to very wide-ranging legislation in the <coughs> uh, And I thought I'd just finish by just saying, uh, just highlighting one or two of the other things that might, might be in that legislation, because I think when we arrive at it, there will be, uh, it won't just be concerned with this, it won't just be concerned with the BBC and its future, which will of course be interesting to everybody, but it won't be. Uh, it won't just be concerned with the future of Sky and ITV and all of those things. I think there are some other really interesting things that I just uh, thought would be worth just leaving, leaving you with as, as what is going to fill this debate in this area in the next two or three years. One is uh, whether or not you can have effective copyright protection on the internet. Uh, why do you need to have, why might you need to have effective copyright protection on the internet? Uh, the reason is because your generation, uh, people of your age in particular, have decided that they are going to download music for free rather than pay for it. Uh, and you are all going to have to work out, along with the rest of us, whether that has consequences for the creation of music and in time film uh, that are acceptable. Um, because
because at the moment it, there is no doubt it is playing absolute merry hell with the economics of the music and film industry. Another one, uh, a second, is whether or not companies can take and use our personal data for commercial use. Uh, so you're probably all on Facebook, I'm sure you all use Google endlessly. And you and we are all going to have to work out whether that is part of the deal. And whether everything you say on Facebook, uh, even though it's not available to everybody, but it's still in your system and they've still got it, uh, whether or not that is there for commercial exploitation, and everybody's fine about that or not. Because uh, if it isn't, there are going to have to be some very significant changes. And if it isn't, quite a lot of these companies are going to have to find a new way of sustaining their business. And I guess the third and most overarching, which is probably the last thought um, before I stop, um, is whether there is an even more fundamental question, which is whether there should or should not be regulation of the internet at all, per se. Uh, because uh, it has grown up in a zeitgeist in which the notion of regulating the internet is essentially taboo. Uh, it was taboo when we did the last legislation in this area, it was not acceptable to be discussed or considered. Uh, and the question now will be whether that is still the case. Uh, and I think it's an open question as to what people mean by regulating the internet, and it's an open question as to what we mean by whether it can actually be regulated, uh, and what the regulation of the internet, if it happens at all, means in an open, modern democracy of the kind that we live in, as opposed to uh, some of the other countries where regulation of the internet already, already happens. I think that's a nice point just to conclude on because there's obviously a, uh, a lovely link between that and the discussion of plurality and news and information in our society. Okay. Now, would you like? Would you like to check up any questions? I don't mind answering. Questions on anything that anyone would be interested to ask me a question on. So, on this or anything else we do. Probably not on some issues we haven't got any responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> well, that was one thing I was going to ask you because you have remit the complaints about uh, is it TV and you know, is it just TV and radio? It is just TV and radio. Um, but the Press Complaints Commission, that mm -hmm. self uh, regulating, yeah. I use the term loosely, yeah. um, that self regulating body would you or would Ofcom or would anybody uh, like to see Ofcom or somebody uh, tell you about Ofcom Commission? We are not enthusiastic about doing it um, and have not sought to do it. Uh, people, various, various people have said from time to time that we should. Uh, we're not out to do it. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's one of those things that you've, you've just got to let your Parliament, you've got to let Parliament decide really. And I don't think it's very good to see. It never appeals to me when you see people running organisations like the one I run, uh, seek, you know, seeking extra powers. Uh, I think it's rather unappealing, and it's not really right. I think I think that's why we have that's why we have Parliament. So if Parliament wants to decide to that the press should be regulated and that everyone wants to do it, then they can. Hitherto, they they've taken the opposite view. And there's a very, very strong tradition of self-regulation of the press now. Clearly, that is being challenged probably, it's probably under greater pressure. It's under considerable pressure at the moment. Now, why is it under considerable pressure at the moment? Well, you know, I think this phone hacking business is really a very, very serious matter. And uh, I think everybody agrees with that. Uh, it's a statement of the obvious, but I think the connection to your question is, it's all, in a sense, emerging now, quite how serious it was. Um, and people are quite understandably saying, well, where was the regulator in all this? And what was the, what was the investigation? And how come they didn't discover it? And you know, you've got to say, as a regulator, that's not an unreasonable thing to ask. Now, they have to speak for themselves as to what happened, and I don't, I don't know exactly, but I think that's why it's so fully back in the public eye again. Does that answer your question? Yes. I sort of it to you. Well, it 
it's not to say that you don't want to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the suggestion that the internet becomes a dual tier service. Yeah. How does Ofcom feel about that? Because yeah. it's quite a big implications. So. Yeah. Okay, so this really is a big question, and uh, uh, this, for, for those of you not familiar with it, um, is something called, uh, which goes under the rubric of something called net neutrality. Does everybody understand what that means? Mixture. Right, so uh, this is a huge issue, and it's driven from the west coast to the states. And it's a preoccupation with sort of Google and Apple and all these people. And their argument is that they want net neutrality. And what that means is that the internet and provision uh, of the service, the underlying infrastructure, so the way the information actually reaches us, should be neutral. So uh, the networks should not be able to discriminate between information you're sending and information you're sending. Uh, and the fear. And you could be Google, and you could be Apple, let's just make it up, or Facebook. And the fear, their fear is that I might own the network, and I would say, well, if you give me a thousand pounds, then your website will work really well, and it will get to people really quickly, but you're not going to give me a thousand pounds, so guess what's going to happen? <coughs> it's going to be very bad, and that is what it's all about. And this is a massive issue, because it's essentially the tectonic plates of the economics of the internet. And it is, I, do, I really do not exaggerate, it is that huge and you, know, you will all use the internet every single day. Uh, I'm certain for, about this, I don't even have to ask you. And this is, these decisions will influence what happens in your internet experience over the next five or ten years and it's a global phenomenon. So it's, it's difficult to say so it's difficult to understate, so to overstate how important it is. So our view of this is that uh, we are in, we the UK are in a much better place than the Americans on this. And the reason for that is that there's far more competition in the UK for the network. So I, you know, it'd be interesting to see who, who you will get your networks from. But you could obviously get it from BT, you could get it from Sky, you could get it from Orange, you could get it from Talk Talk, you could get it from Zen. You can get it from, I mean, there's actually about 200 different providers and there's half a dozen, you can get it from Virgin. You know, there's loads of different providers. And what that means is that you can all choose if you don't like someone's doing something to Facebook uh, or some other site, you can go to somebody else. And that gives us far more protection. Now, in America, you've essentially only got two providers. You've got the cable network and you've got the uh, AT&T, the big tele. So you'll really... <laughs> You've got quite a big problem if they start doing this and you don't like what they're doing. So at the moment, our view is that we probably don't need to do anything drastic, but we've got to really keep an eye on it. We've got to really keep an eye on it. And we're very aware, uh, I think, of the issues. And, you know, again, what? I mean, have any of you seen, uh, have you ever, how many of you, have you all seen Social Network, the film about Facebook? Yes, lots and lots. Well, one of the arguments about this, which I think is really interesting, is would Facebook, if you didn't have net neutrality, you didn't have this completely open internet, where you just get your stuff up on a server and it's gone and it's there and everybody can get it, would something like Facebook have been invented? Could it have reached its audience? Because the network might have said, well, we don't know who you are, we're not interested in you, we've never heard of you, we haven't got any money, so you can just get to the back of the queue because we've got to deal with somebody else, we've got to deal with Apple who we know and who are rich and they're giving us some money so you're going in the slow lane and so that is quite a profound issue and you know Facebook rather like Google before it, rather like Yahoo and various other, like eBay in the old days, uh, uh, you know these, did, these, did, these were innovations that came incredibly fast. And one of the reasons was because they could reach an audience in minutes. So that is a big issue. And it ought to be a big issue for any of you and any of your friends who, are coming, who will come out of university and think you might be entrepreneurs or set up businesses or be involved in businesses in that world. Because it, it's an absolutely crucial part of it. So that's roughly where we are. It does fall under your jurisdiction. Though. It does. We have, uh, <coughs> we, have, we have explicit powers in relation to it that we have 
only just assumed. So we, we're literally looking at it at the moment, and it will be. Uh, we, we've got to. We're consulting on it at the moment, but we won't, and we'll decide what our vision is. Probably, probably three or four months' time. So it does. You know, but I think this issue will become a bigger and bigger issue over the next decade, and it really will. It's not going to go away because it's, it's about who controls the underlying. You know, it's um, I'm trying to think of the best analogy. Um, it's like a motorway, and that there's somebody actually owns the motorway, and someone can close the inside lane if they want to, or they can spot your. They can say, they could say, right, well we don't like. You know, there are no red Fords that are going to go on this motorway, or all red Fords have to go in the slow lane and can only go 30 miles an hour. That's that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So it's going to be a huge issue. Yeah. yeah um, you talked about how uh, if there is re uh, regulatory powers for the plurality of the yeah. media. They should be able to have powers to force companies to give up certain... Uh, well, that's the extreme position. Mm. Yeah. But at the same time, you earlier talked about five years down the line, we could find ourselves in a position where um, loads of media uh, have closed down and there, there aren't any buyers in the market. Yeah. So I was just wondering how you think those two positions can be... Reconciled. That's a very good question, and the answer is that I, there's no, is that there's no, I, I can't know how you would reconcile them, and it may be very difficult to, and it may not be possible to. So you, you know, I mentioned divestments because I think ultimately you'd have to be willing to do that in theory. I, mean, I think it's quite possible you've never got anywhere near that kind of solution, but you have to be, you have to be ultimately willing to have a measure of that kind, should it ever be necessary. Now you hope it wouldn't, it wouldn't be necessary. And all of the changes that I've been talking about may take us in the opposite direction. You know, if, 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 the, if that data I mentioned to you, that the TV news and COVID and all, that if in five years or ten years' time the internet isn't 7%, it's 77%, then we might be in a completely different world because people tend to get their information from a wider range of sources on the internet. You know, it's much easier. People used to buy one newspaper, uh, whereas if you say if you've moved your news gathering from a newspaper purchase to the internet, you, what I've found is that people tend to, you know, they've bookmarked three or four newspapers. So you've immediately expanded the amount of the diversity of their sources of news. So you could see changes which make all this ease as an issue, or it might work the other way, and I, don't, I just don't think we know. And therefore, in terms of remedies or concerns, we just don't know. I think our point is, why would you leave yourself without the tool in case it is a problem? You don't actually have to ever use it, and in fact, I hope we would never have to use it. But why would you leave yourself in a situation where, if, if the problem did arise, there's nothing you could do about it? That seems to me to be very poor planning. You'd never run a business or any organisation on that basis, so we shouldn't run a country on that basis. If I can put it that strong. <laughs> but isn't that the same problem if uh, media outlets lead, leads on go onto the internet anyway? Because the people who own the online papers are the same people who own the print papers. Yes. So if they go out of business, you still have the same. Yeah, no, you might. You might. Um, but you might have others who've started businesses who can do it a different way on the internet. But there haven't been any companies who've managed to set up, for example, the Huffington Post, which has been incredibly successful, it's only just turned a profit yeah. this year, and that's because it's had money to invest for years and years and years, and it works on a network of blogging and work for free. Yeah. But other than that, everyone else has started from a newspaper basis, yeah. as far as I'm aware, or uh, like something Google. like Google. Yeah. Well, Google doesn't... Yeah, 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 it just aggregates. You see, all Google does is find it for you. Mm. It doesn't source and create news. It has no journalists. So when Google says we do news people, the answer is no, you don't. Uh, what you do is what you've always done, which is find <coughs> stuff for people. But you're not a content provider, and you don't create content, or, and let alone news. And it's really important that people understand that. Um, so you're you're and you're right. You know, and I, I think I said 
at uh, one point, no, nobody's cracked this. And that's again why you, that, you, you, know, you could take a, you, you can take a glass half full, glass half empty view of this. And if you're glass half full, then you say, you know, there could be many new diverse sources of news and it's, it's going to flourish and people will have more plurality, will be more diverse and so on. Or you can take a glass half empty and you can say, and none of these news organisations have been able to work out how to make it, make their numbers add up on it. Um, nobody else is coming in with anything that resembles what you would call quality journalism. So journalists actually pay to actually find out news and report it properly, as opposed to just people in their bedrooms blogging, which is fine, but that's not proper journalism. That's typically that's opinion anecdote unconfirmed and it's quite often just gossip and that's it's quite dangerous if we just rely upon that. Uh, so you know we've got a set of standards and we've developed an understanding of what journalism is and what professional journalism is and it isn't people in their bedrooms making stuff up or, or reporting stuff because their friend told them in the pub. It isn't that. So that's fine and it's all very entertaining and it's made the world richer or richer in the in a sense of diversity of life, but it isn't professional journalism. And if you go back to, right back to what I said right at the start, you know, why is the media important? You know, it has many faults and sometimes I hate it. And you, know, you can moan and complain about it, but why is it important? It's important because only through a range of you know, proper, journal proper journalists who seek out and report the news can you actually hold to account politicians and big companies who exercise huge power over our lives. And you can see in areas where it's weak and feeble, what typically happens is you know, politicians become corrupt, businesses do dirty deals, because nobody's stopping and nobody's looking at it and nobody's examining it and no one's challenging it. And that is when the, that is exactly when the media and journalism in particular is to be treasured. Understood about the internet and the whole blogging thing was that they just didn't understand. And you know, I heard some ludicrous utopianism uh, about what so-called user-generated content, and this was going to be the new journalism, citizen journalism. <coughs> and you know, it does have a role, uh, and there are formulations which I think are really quite interesting, quite useful. But it is a professional journalism, and I said, and it, it always amazed me that anybody managed to convince themselves that it was. But in these kinds of technological changes, of which the internet is a great example, we always get this kind of techno-utopianism. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the first time, it won't be the last. Um, do you think that I've come to agreement with it? Or would have been asked to look into the plurality question if it hadn't been for the reputation of the Pramoda and the News Corporation? <laughs> that is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so if it had been somebody else? Yeah. Very good question. I like to think that the answer to that is yes. And of, but of course I don't know. And it's difficult to disconnect the two points because the people who were calling for us to, be, to look at it were clearly in part motivated by what they believed in their doctor reputation to be. So, it's, and they were very vociferous in calling for us to it. So it's, it's difficult to disconnect them. I like to believe that, I, I, I don't think it's, you know, it isn't about individuals this, and I'm always quite cautious about this. And like, you know, it's about, so it is about individuals at one level, but it's about, it's only about individuals to the extent that they control media. It's not about the individual as a person. Um, and it could be about a company, uh, as well as an individual. Um, now, as it happens, that company is you know, overwhelmingly controlled by one family, so one thing leads to another. But so I like to think the answer would be yes. So if um, if plurality would be less of an issue if you were if you were convinced that the companies in question were not controlled by a yeah. individual or a family. 
So let's take, the, if, if you believed, what one defence, if, if it was a different organisation, one defence of it might be, look at our record, so this is another imaginary individual company, look at our record, we never ever interfere with the editors, we never tell them what to run, we have absolutely nothing to do with it, we're only interested in the business. And that is an interesting defence, and you'd have to take that into account. Whereas, of course, with the News Corporation, you have quite a number of people who will say the exact opposite, and will say, well, there is interference in the editorial line, and, you know, and so on and so forth. And we, we have to try and sift that out. So that would be a potential, it would be in those sort of would actually, I could absolutely see that would be a defensive, but definitely. So these parts of the mix is the answer to your question, you can't avoid them in parts of the mix. How much weight you give to it is a different matter of difficult to know. Well, as I say, it's interesting you say that because we had the chief editor from Sky News about a year ago, okay. a hand on heart, he categorically said he'd never been interfered with editorially yeah. when he ran his own ship. Yeah, yeah, no, well, he, he um, I've forgotten his name, what's it called? John Murray. No, that's right. Um, I mean, they, they are, I'm, I, one of the reasons that we felt strongly about this is because we think Sky News is really good. So we don't want it. We don't. We didn't want there to be any risk that it would end up not being good. Now, at the moment, he says that hand on heart, and that's you know that's what he said to us. And I'm delighted to hear that. And the only issue for that for us is that we want to make sure that's carrying on, carries on being the case. And you can't pretend there isn't a risk that it wouldn't carry on being the case, because at the moment, he's in a company. He's in a big company like Sky in which News Corporation only owns 39%. Now, common sense tells you that there is a profound difference between owning 39% of something with a set of directors around the table and having to take account of the other 61% people's interest, as opposed to when you own something 100%. When you own something 100%, you say what happens, without any qualification. So there's a profound difference. And I think our concern really was we hear and we know that Sky News people say we never get editorial, there's no editorial interference, and we want to make sure that absolutely remains the case. Um, he also has to say that, of course, because the, uh, which he doesn't have to, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the broadcasting code, he's subject to broadcast code and that, and that requires him to be involved. But the key, that's the key thing. The key thing is he wants that to remain the case. So my answer to him is I'm delighted that's the case. And these measures, if implemented, will secure that future for you. And you'll have more confidence going into the future that you'll be able to stay like that. Because I presume you thought that was a good thing. So that's what you want to achieve, I think. Um, well, part of the issue with uh, News International taking over 100% is that a lot of people uh, were afraid that it would become more like Fox News yeah. uh, in terms of editorial line. Yeah. Um, which then brings in the whole question of balance and how does Ofcom decide the balance because uh, yeah. a lot of issues, I mean I have complained to Ofcom about a phone in where um, someone was telling her listeners not to vaccinate her children yeah. and so complained on public health grounds. Right. So well, yeah, well, I'm glad to hear you're exercising your rights to complain to us. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Hope you've got some sort of an answer. <coughs> I had to get an answer. It wasn't what I was looking for. All right. Um, I think, it, well, people have raised the spectre of, Sky, of Fox News. And, you know, Fox News is quite something. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let me tell you what the position is, and then I'll come back to Fox News. The position is that we have to have, this is the point I was just making, you know, there have to be, broadcast news has to be impartial. So as of now, the law would not allow you to make Fox News, Fox News in the UK, uh, and direct it to the British audience. Um, now, there are various people in the in News Corporation, News International, who have said at various points, you know, I think you know, we would quite like to try Fox News in the UK. Things like that. They can't at the moment. But one of the issues here is that that is totally dependent upon the broadcasting code, which might get removed at some point. And I think, again, I think various News Corporation people have said that it should go and they should be free to decide whatever they want. Now, again, if that's the case, then you end up with a Fox News and it's 100% controlled 
without qualification by news corp, and you might end up with Fox News. So I, I feel the protections in relation to that are currently pretty good and pretty strong, and I don't think it's going to happen. It's interesting that simultaneously in the US, I mean, Fox News has done very well commercially, but it's also interesting that in the US at the moment, there is a really serious public debate about how far it's gone and how far it goes because of the shooting, because of, the shooting of, uh, of the senator. And it's not just Fox News, it's all those rather than talk shows where uh, there is, you know, there is a, there's a tone in the language which is so aggressive uh, that it, you, know, you do, you do wonder about what impact it's having. Now, people can turn it off, can't they? So we mustn't overstate it, but it is nothing like we have over here. And you do wonder about whether it is, what role it's playing in civil society and, and, the, uh, uh, and what it's contributing to public debate. Uh, and I think the issue with the with the with the shooting of the senator is, is is extremely you know has raised that issue in in, in really quite a neat way. Uh, and you know, Fox News reaches millions of people, and it has a particularly um, it has one or two journalists who are particularly strident in the way they exercise their opinion, express their opinion. So <coughs> keep an eye on that. But at the moment in the UK, I think it's probably okay. I mean, the only, the only thing which is intriguing to me beyond that is you know, whether if somebody launched a Fox News, if they could, which they can't, and then they could, whether it would actually succeed. Because I, part of me thinks it would just fail because people would just turn it off. Because in the US it has succeeded. Isn't Fox News successful because it specialises in preaching to the converted? Yeah, possibly. And there's obviously a big market who want to be preached to in that way in the US. It's a much bigger market. Uh, and there's 300 million people plus, so that may be the reason. That may, that may, that may be. And it, and it's true. It's, it was very distinctive and very different to what was there before, which was, you know, much more mainstream and I guess would be described as more liberal. So it, it may be. I, I don't know. I'm not sure it would work, work in the UK. And the, the, the other thing you have to remember is they don't have the BBC. So people would look at the BBC and think. You know, well, this is what we understand news to be, broadly speaking. And there's this sort of ranting, you know, over here. And I don't know, but it, maybe it would find an audience and maybe it would succeed. But you can't do it at the moment, so I'm pleased to report. Yeah. Uh, a question on um, a different topic, uh, and it's on the proliferation of. Uh, Broadband access, uh, and there's this uh, new telecom package on new directives on yeah. the EU level. And uh, I was asking whether you think that the incentives to actually invest in um, these uh, more sophisticated yeah. broadband um, yeah. grids, if they're actually there, or whether yeah. you think it's not enough. Right, well, that you're very well informed about the EU telecoms package. Uh, yeah, I wrote my PhD about that. Oh, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly overstated about the risk, the risk to investment. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the UK, you know, BT are rolling out to 60% of the country, Virgin Media have already done it. This is this is what we call super fast broadband, so this is speeds you know, in excess of 25 megabits per second, assuming that leads everything to a good. It's a currency you understand. <laughs> uh, so we need, you know, we need to have more of this to make it much faster is the argument. I think we're not far away. I mean, it's broadly okay, and I, I think there's a lot of special pleading going on from corporate interests, and I think you know, part of my job is to watch that and try and not get to, uh, get sucked into it too much. I mean, you know, you'd like to see more investment and you'd like to see it go further, of course. On the other hand, do I think it would make any sort of rational sense to clip my fingers and spend 25 billion pounds tomorrow to put 200 megabits per second into every single home in the country. No. Crazy. It would be a large waste of money. So you've just got to see these things over a few years. 
Uh, I think the time will come when you probably do need to put more public money into it to make sure it happens. But it isn't yet, and you know you want to see these companies compete and, and roll out some networks and see what see where it goes. See if people want it. But you're of the opinion that there should be something like a regulation holiday for these services? No, I'm definitely not, because uh, I would never job there. <laughs> um, no, I'm not going to that, because if we did that, then you'd end up with a monopoly supplier. And yeah. we'd be back to the old days, which none of you can remember, which was when there was only one telephone company, and there would be only one broadband company, and if you didn't like their service, you wouldn't be able to go anywhere else. And I think that would be a catastrophic disaster for the country. So that's why I've got very, um, a very clear view of that, and that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, product placement within um, TV. Yeah. Um, it's my understanding that um, you can now have product placement as long as it doesn't uh, interfere with the editorial content or it doesn't. Yeah, that's right. But um, at the same time, isn't it now that uh, for the first time producers are also being accorded a, a part of the advertising money rather than just the, the networks themselves? Mm. So I'm just wondering what the thought uh, process is about how they don't think. That will influence it, well, this is, this is unfortunately very, very complicated. And the short answer is that producers have always been able to extract a share of the advertising revenue, but they don't do it in the form of a share of the advertising revenue. So, for example, uh, if you are the producer of the X Factor, you know roughly how many millions of people can watch it, and you then derive the amount of money's worth, and then you say, I want my fair share of that. That's how the economics of television production work. Um, now, the, it is true that in product placement, there is scope for them there to be a, what's called an upfront deal, so the producer could say, well, if there is going to be a product placed in this, so there's going to be a, you know, I, no, I could have had one here. In fact, I have. Mm -hmm. So there's my Strathmore. <laughs> Have we received anything for that? <laughs> um, so I might, the producer um, might have said, well, if that's what we're going to do, we'll organise it, and the deal is we get 50% of it and you get 50% of it. So in other words, it's pre-fixed. Um, and that, that, I think, as I recall, is possible and probably will happen. Um, I mean, I, I don't know where the product placement will go. I, I think you're actually be quite slow and steady. Because the last thing that the TV companies want to do is start plastering products all over things that everybody watch and people say, I really don't like that. I now feel this is awful. So I think they'll be quite intelligent about it. And what you'll see is just the odd thing crop up in the odd place. Uh, you know, you, you know, you'll see a hot chocolate. You'll make hot chocolate. You know, whatever it is. Um, and you just see them crop up, crop up. And I think they will have handled it well if, if nobody notices. Not that it doesn't happen, but if nobody notices. <coughs> and that's in their hands. You know, I've said this to them repeatedly. If, there's a, if they do it badly and there's a huge public backlash and people say, well, really, what an appalling decision to allow these products to be placed, then the politicians will cancel it. Politicians will turn around and say, well, well God, Right, the public hated that, so we'll have to um, stop it. So it's in their hands, really. Now, we, we don't allow it in news. It's really important to say this. We don't allow it in news, because there's office back to work, what I was saying earlier. You don't want those sorts of conflicts. We don't allow it in current affairs, and we don't allow it in children. We don't want the hard sell on children, and that's, you know, so there are restrictions on it. But you know, we, the conclusion we came to was what did it really matter if there was a bottle of Strathmore on the table during you know, Good Morning Sky Sports fans on Sky Sports 2 on Saturday morning between 10 and 11. But where do you do find product placement starting? I'm worried about that. <laughs> um, I mean, I worry about a lot of things, but I just couldn't. <laughs> The last thing to keep me awake at night, and I just that one wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Where, 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 where would you define product placement as starting? You, we all know that the motor car companies have been giving yeah. cars to the film companies right yeah. from the early days, and that is product placement, and no one's given it a second thought. Well, that's true, 
And there are two answers to that. There are firstly that there are things with products that are placed that are American imports. So American movies have products placed in them. And that's done under the jurisdiction of America and it's allowed in America, so you can't take something out of a film that's finished. So the work that whether I mean there are once you're familiar with this, it's quite entertaining to watch some American mm. films because you can play spot the spot the product in place. If you want to do it and have a lot of fun with it, uh, the film to watch is Sex in the City. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just Gucci handbags, and they're all product, they're all placed products. Mm -hmm. No, the dress is all placed. I don't, I can't tell which designers they are, but apparently so. Everything is placed, uh, and so that's one reason. And uh, the um, uh, how do I get into remind me what? Don't define where. The natural use of oh, a yeah, product sorry, became sorry. So, the other, so the other problem with it, in the UK problem, or the other reason you see it in the UK, or what you think it is sometimes, is that prop placement has, has been allowed, and that is the provision of a prop which is genuinely part of the film. And there's a bit of a grey area between the two. And one of the arguments for permitting product placement in the UK was that it's a really grey area and nobody quite knows how to police it. So that was, that was one of the factors. But the most the most uh, visible side of it are the American movies that come over. Um, Sex and the City was, was it. but the Bond movies. The Bond. I'm, I'm going to say Aston yeah. Martin. Look at this Rolex. <laughs> uh, and the cars. All yeah. the cars in the Bond movies are obviously all placed um, at some considerable cost, I should imagine. Um, so you can watch them and you, you'll see. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely. I, I mean, I feel comfortable with where we've reached on it for now. And I'm going to be interested to see how it, how it develops and how they handle it. Um, and I hope, they, I hope they do it in a sophisticated way which respects the audience and the viewer, not which patronises and, and insults them. And I do think if they do the latter, there'll be a backlash and they'll have to stop it. And that, that, you know, we'll just have to shrug at that point and say, well, you had your chance and you blew it. See how we go. Any other final ones? I was just wondering um, what the thought process, process was between um, their having um, a watershed on the television but not on the radio. That is another good question. So that's one of the problems for when I said regulating the internet. You know, and that, there's, and there are a range of problems when we talk about what might regulating the internet mean and all those sort of things. But one of the problems is that um, have any of you heard of UView? Mm. Sort of, yeah. Well, what is going to happen in the next year or two, which hasn't quite happened yet, but which is going to happen without a shadow of a doubt, is that there are going to be boxes, television set-top boxes, that come out and they will essentially all quite quickly become uh, internet boxes. So you will be able to get anything you want on the internet on your TV. So, and the, the, the best, the most easy way of understanding it is, is the I, iPlayer. I'm sure you all use the iPlayer on your laptops and your PC as well. It'll be the iPlayer embedded in your television, now, and then other versions of it. So the, the, the key problem that this creates is that the watershed works, particularly for. You know, it's, it's, it's really about children. And you, know, you, you all probably didn't realise it, but your parents, and many of your parents, were probably monitoring and aware of the watershed and making sure that, you know, certainly before about 14, they were sort of, you know, were careful what the children watch. And the watershed is amazingly successful. I and mean, the vast majority of British people understand what it is, how it works, and what it's supposed to do. And given that it's never ever been advertised, it's never marketed, nobody ever tells you, everybody knows. And it's a phenomenon in that sense. The problem with the internet and the iPlayer on the TV screen and all that is, it blows the watershed to pieces. Because you just, you know, your 12 year old comes home, uh, finds the X rated, or even triple X rated movie that was on last night at 1am on, you know, channel filth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, number 671. And just calls it up. <coughs> what do you do about it? So it literally blows a hole in it. And at the moment we live on the basis, we survive on the basis that that happens on the laptop or on the PC. And that's 
that's different to the television. And the problem with all this, with these changes that I'm describing is that that's just going to disappear. That distinction will disappear. So I don't know what the answer to this is yet. And it's one of the most important things for us to think about with the government in the next 18 months to two years because it's not very far away. Uh, and I, I genuinely don't know. And some people say we've just got to give up because obviously the internet's just going to blow it all apart. No, you do. Uh, it's all. It's obviously the water is there after the nonsense. You know, what my example, you know, my people will give the kind of example I just gave. I don't believe that. I think the watershed is so popular and useful and valued by parents of particularly younger children. I think once, once kids get to 14, it's a bit difficult to control what they're doing anyway. But you know, younger than that, I think people really value it. Um, I think the art, therefore, is to try and recreate something of that value rather than give up on it. But I'm not sure how you do that yet. So any bright ideas on that, <laughs> I'd be very grateful for. But it's a, it's, um, it's a kind of phenomenon. It's a fascinating phenomenon in water. I, mean, I can't put it. I can't put it. We, we, we did a survey to, to try and understand whether people did know. Cause we, we were we ready to be, believe that people didn't know what it was, in which case it's completely pointless. That is staggering. Mm -hmm. But people say, oh yeah, I know exactly what it is. It's really good, I really like it. Um, no one's ever told me anyone. <laughs> I mean, how did I find out? No one told you. Who told you what it was? She <laughs> 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 just don't know. And yet somehow everybody broadly knows what it is. And everybody broadly knows when it is. And everybody broadly knows how it works. It's incredible. And we get, to, just to illustrate it, we get furious complaints. If it's breached and we get, you know, we get a bit of nudity on EastEnders or something, Outrageous, why aren't we releasing the internet, uh, the watershed? What has happened to our broadcasting regulator? You know, are you asleep on the watch? <laughs> Absolutely the works. I mean, the, the original press <coughs> one was, uh, what was it, the, the lesbian kiss on Brookside. Oh, mighty, mighty. <laughs> How could this be before the watershed? What a disgrace. You know, so everybody knows what it is. So if, it, if it's so well widely recognised and liked, why not just carry it through onto radio as well? Now. <laughs> <laughs> On radio. Just it makes it a wee bit difficult for us as well. <laughs> I'm trying to think. It's just not. It's not a problem on radio, really. I mm -hmm. think there is something. So I'm going to embarrass myself next time. Not quite sure how it works. We just don't have the same level of problems with radio. I tell you why it is. Because the vast bulk of cut it, I cannot, I, you don't need it in radio at the moment. The reason is the following. The vast bulk of, uh, of, of speech radio, firstly, it's not visual, so you're not going to have a nudity problem, for example. Secondly, the vast bulk of speech radio, so you're listening to drama or things of that kind. Is all BBC. There's very little that isn't BBC. And BBC has its has a very high set of digital standards and would would, would respect a sort of watershed type um, situation. And thirdly, all you know, commercial radio, apart from talk sport and things like that, but the vast vast of, of, of uh, commercial radio is essentially music. So you don't have a watershed problem. I mean, you could conceivably have, have some with some pretty edgy hip-hop, I suppose. Um, but we haven't had complaints about that. And the problem with a lot of that hip-hop is it can't hear it. Can't <laughs> it so, yeah, I'm thinking so, of primarily like, the, the language issue. Yeah, well, that, no, that is, there, is, uh, there are rules about that. And um, they're not, but they're not sort of more, they're more general rules mm -hmm. rather than more shared issues. Share issue. So that's why it doesn't work really. But you can see, vi once you have a video over the internet, it's really tough. Mm -hmm. This is coming like a, you know, it will be, I mean, I'm waiting for the Daily Mail or whoever else to discover this, and there will be all these stories of children sitting at home watching the TV, and they've discovered how to work the, you know, the on-demand, the iPlayer type 
functionality and then downloading and all sorts of stuff, watching it in the living room, eating a piece of toast with a thing cup. And then mummy and daddy walk in and they say, where the hell did you get that? And they said, well, what are you talking about? Just, <coughs> just keyed in. And because mummy and daddy will, will quite often not have worked out how easy it is to do it. So I think this is really, people can wake up to this in the next five years. And, uh, because this is going to create some problems. <laughs> All right. I hope that was useful. That was interesting. Um, I'm sure you agree that was fascinating yeah. talk and some really interesting questions there. Thanks, guys. Thank you for coming. Um, please join me in giving Everett a round of applause.